Hey guys, Crave the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. It's been a while, I know, but I am back for now with tons of filters all over the place. So all of those filters that I have, there are of different types. So I have like, for instance, the Optolong L Pro here, uh, which is a broadband type of filter. I have the uh, Optolong CLS CCD. I have somewhere a UV IR cut filter from SV Boni, but I also have like narrowband filters from uh, Batter, from uh, Astrodon, and uh, dual band filters like from Antlia or from Optolong or from IDAS, for instance. And why do I have all of those filters with me today is because I am going to be testing those filters and quantifying them in a proper way using a digital spectrometer. And you may be asking yourself, why? Why would I need to do that? Well, if you do, if you are asking yourself that, you probably haven't seen my most recent videos, which talk about how filters can lie to you and can be very inconsistent and not quite up to specifications. And uh, the nature of filters, especially narrowband filters, even if they work a little bit, even though they work at like 20% of their specifications, it will look to the inexperienced amateur or even the experienced amateur actually that they're working fine when you're really losing a lot of imaging time uh, that you would not be losing if you had a, a filter that performed up to specifications. And for instance, in one video, I uh, talked about the uh, L-Extreme and how it was very inconsistent between different people. Some people, for instance, using it on uh, a RASA type of telescope, so very fast focal ratio and very large central aperture, uh, completely lost all H-alpha signal. Whereas when I use it with my uh, RASA equivalent telescope, my Hyperstar C6, I get the H-alpha. Why? It's because not all Optolong L-Extremes are built equally. And similarly, I mentioned a lot of issues I've had with my uh, batter narrowband filters that are optimized for fast telescopes, especially things like RASA or Hyperstar. And uh, here I'm going to be able to quantify all of those issues. Now this video might be a bit, little bit long, so I'll make sure to have chapters down below and feel free to go through those chapters because we're gonna look at how I am going to quantify my filters um, and also we're going to look at the filters one by one afterwards. <laughs> so it's gonna take a little bit of time. The main tool that I will be using for uh, quantifying those filters or qualifying those filters, whatever the right word is, is in this little black box by uh, Goya Lab. So Goya Lab is a French startup company that provides, uh, well, spectrometers. And spectrometers lets you analyze spectrums. Uh, the, this particular spectrometer, it's a tiny little thing like that. It's, you can actually uh, use it with just a smartphone and a smartphone app that's free and connected connect via Bluetooth to this uh, spectrometer. And you can also connect to it via computer, which is what I've been doing because I'll go into the details as to why in a moment. And along with the, the spectrometer from this French startup, I bought uh, what they call the Golight, which is, um, uh, a cluster of LED lights, as far as I understand, including with a little fan because they get warm, um, that is powered by USB-C. And uh, it will basically give you a relatively flat spectrum uh, from uh, 400 nanometers to a bit above 700 nanometers, which is exactly what we are looking at for the visual spectrum and for our astrophotography filters. And of course, when I say relatively flat, uh, it's not perfectly flat, which means that we need to take flat frames effectively to uh, to cancel out any variations that we have with this uh, little light, but it works really, really well. And you'll see that in the results. Now, along with this, I got a little adapter here. Actually, I got a, a couple of little um, adapters here, and those were um, built for two specification basically by Goya Lab. And the way that those little adapters work is that I can take a two inch filter here, for instance, this is my SV Boni UV IR cut filter, and I can like place it on the adapter and the filter just fits in there. It's not screwed in or anything for now, it's just fitting in there. And this adapter has little magnets that goes that go on the light. So I can just like put it on the light. Now it's uh, properly fit on the light. Then on top of that, I can put my uh, filter that I want to measure. 
and then afterwards I can just put the spectrometer on top and if the light is on so connected to USB-C and I've connected let's say to Bluetooth via Bluetooth to my spectrometer which can be charged via USB-C as well then I will immediately it's instantaneous see the spectrum of the filter on um, on my uh, phone but when I got the uh, spectrometer which um, had been calibrated at the factory I noticed that the measurements were slightly off and um, communicating with the guys at Goelab I understood that the shipping had probably um, uh, basically bounced around the, the spectrometer too much and it was slightly out of uh, calibration and if you've ever owned a, a schmidt cassegrain telescope you're familiar with that the collimation of your schmidt cassegrain typically after shipping is slightly off and this is the same with the spectrometer so i needed a way to calibrate it and it so happens that goelab their software their desktop software allows you to recalibrate the um the spectrometer which is awesome now there are two methods of calibration. There is the simple calibration that is very easy to do. And to do that simple calibration, you just need a flow compact light bulb. You know, all those old, uh, older long life uh, light bulbs before LED light bulbs became a thing. Uh, just buy one of those and you will just point the uh, spectrometer to it and it will pick up on the um, on the, the wavelength spikes that you get I think from the mercury that's in this uh, little light bulb and you get ni four nice little peaks and the calibration program lets you basically uh, it will uh, automatically go towards those peaks and and calibrate the spectrometer it's pretty cool that being said because there are only four peaks across the whole frequency range that we're considering the uh, calibration is not precise enough for very narrowband filters like my Astrodon 3 nanometers full width half max um, filters. So I needed something better. And something better, uh, I went all in and I bought uh, from AliExpress a Mercury Ar Argon lamp along with a fiber optic cable. And uh, Goelab sent me a fiber optic adapter for their spectrometer. And with that, this Mercury Argon lamp gives us uh, several good um, wavelengths, um, several good, good peaks of emission um, at, uh, in, in the wavelengths between 400 and 7 nanometers, which we are interested in. Uh, but on top of that, I needed some even more scientific equipment to really calibrate the spectrum in the red part of the spectrum, because this is where we have H-alpha and S2, and I wanted really precise measurements there. And the Mercury Argon lamp, which I bought from AliExpress for $200, by the way, um, is mostly in the blue-green range, which is great for oxygen-3, but not great for the rest. So I used uh, some equipment I had uh, lying uh, on hand, which is highly scientific an electric kettle <laughs> why would i be using an electric kettle to um to to calibrate my spectrometer simply because of the red lamp that we have here this is a neon lamp and neon happens to have tons of nice tight emission uh spikes in the red spectrum and we can use that to calibrate the uh the spectrometer and when you use and you can use those lamps one after another in a method that they call the scientific calibration method where i'll take a few peaks from the mercury argon lamp and then i'll follow up with the neon lamp i took uh, i think around nine or maybe ten peaks emission peaks across the spectrum and uh, and uh, then the calibration is actually done uh, in is polynomial so they fit a polynomial to all of your um, of the emission spikes that you've identified and it works absolutely amazing because then i was able to see that for uh, filters whose spectrum i already know because i had them measured by a lab the goya lab uh, spectrometer actually completely agreed with them and so this is really how I managed to get the best calibration. Now the smartphone app by, uh, can only, as far as I know, use the uh, standard simple calibration that's obtained with uh, this, uh, this light bulb there. Whereas the desktop version of the software uh, will be able to use and uses by default the advanced calibration obtained with this and a neon light. And that's why I've been using the software um, the desktop software to really qualify all of my filters. 
Okay, so now what is the cost of this uh, spectrometer? So the combination of this uh, spectrometer, which is called the Goya Lab Indigo, along with the Go Lights, is around, um, the set of it is around 1800 euros plus tax and shipping. So it is not cheap. The, um, and the mercury argon lamp that, I, that you really want if you're going to characterize narrowband filters is 200, it was $211, if I remember correctly, from AliExpress. And then my neon light bulb came with my uh, electric kettle, which was very, very cheap. But overall, you're looking at a bit above $2,000 to qualify all of your filters. Now, I want to make it clear, by the way, uh, I am not receiving any payment or anything from Goya Lab, and uh, this spectrometer was not sent to me for free. I did get a small discount, on both the spectrometer and the uh, light, but I had to pay for it, right? And it's, it's a lot of money. But it is the only solution that I could find that was both uh, out of the box working, easy to calibrate for really precise calibration, extremely precise to qualify filters, and you're gonna see the results once we go back inside. But uh, why would anyone in their right mind spend so much money above $2,000 on the spectrometer and the tools to make sure that it's perfectly calibrated even after shipping. Well, it's simply because um, all of those filters put together uh, and then I take my Astrodome filters and my L-Extreme and my Antlia filter and maybe my Optolong L-Ultimate filter, which is three nanom nanometer dual band pass. All of those filters, they cost a lot of money and if they don't perform to spec, I've effectively wasted my money and I don't even know it. Right, and that is absolutely terrible. So if I'm, let's say, an advanced amateur astrophotographer, I've already spent $10,000 on my setup, maybe more, and I have, I'm planning to buy tons and tons of filters across my astrophotography career, right? And if you're starting astrophotography, especially if you're in a, in a city like here in Tokyo, you are going to buy thousands of dollars worth of filters throughout the, your career. And then it might make sense to have something like that to actually double check once you receive a filter that it performs up to specs. Um, in addition to that, uh, and another use case that I thought about was simply like if you're a dealer uh, in any country, right, a local dealer selling filters, well, it might make sense to just measure those, those filters and provide the me measurement when you, you sell those filters to end users and maybe even charge a premium for exceptional filters. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, my own Optolong L Extreme filter is actually an exceptional sample. And that sample should cost a lot more than the run of the mill L Extremes, uh, simply because it works great across a very large range of focal ratios. Now, there are some limitations with this spectrometer. Uh, the spectrometer basically has like a sliding window that's 1.5 nanometers wide. It's basically a Gaussian sampling curve within that window uh, that, uh, that will average the values across that. Still, because it's a Gaussian, it's, it's quite precise. And we get points every 0.5 nanometer, which is more than enough for any astrophotography uh, filter. But that means that the narrower the filter, uh, the more difficult it is to see whether the band pass has a flat top, for example, a beautiful flat top or not. And also very narrow filters will tend to show less uh, transmission uh, rate with the spectrometer, simply because the spectrometer is slightly averaging uh, the values outside of the, out of the peak and inside the peak. So the, uh, when you're looking at the transmission of each filter, you should really be only comparing filters that have the same full width half max. So I would be comparing my astronome filters with one another and my batter 3.5 nanometer band pass with one another, for instance. But you will see how this looks like in a moment as we go inside. And we're now inside and we're going to look at the filters. But before that, I want to show you a bit how the actual interface with the spectrometer looks like. I'm not going to show the spectrometer directly in use because the little fan in this lamp is has a high pitched whine that is very, very annoying to listen to for a long time. And I don't want it to perturb the actual recording. But just so you can see on my screen right now, we are in the software and we're looking at the spectrum of the L Extreme, uh, the Optolong L Extreme dual band uh, filter taken via this spectrometer and the, uh, and the light there. And uh, if the, the way to take 
uh, the, uh, the spectrum is very simply to put like the filter in between those two elements and on the screen click the capture uh, button and that's all there is to it. Uh, we can also take a dark frame <laughs> which basically tells us like what is the base noise level floor at each wavelength of the uh, the whole system and we can take a reference frame which is very close to what we would call a, a flat frame for us which is the spectrum of the white light here without any filter so then we can properly do comparisons because it's slightly wavy and so we want to be able to normalize all of that and with that we're able to look at the uh, L extreme here and I can, uh, I can have a cursor and examine stuff so we can see the, uh, the tip of that particular pike is around 501 nanometers. Uh, this one is around like 557.5. Uh, we'll look into the details of the L Extreme uh, later on. And within the software, what's uh, very interesting besides like zooming in, out, auto scaling, all this kind of stuff, choosing your exposure and calibrating your camera is that because I have taken a reference frame, frame I can also look, right now I'm looking at absolute values. Uh, which are like random units from the camera basically and uh, you can see that the oxygen 3 spike looks higher than the H alpha spike but this is actually due to the spectrum of that little light there once we take the spectrum out of it we can now we're now in percentage of transmittance and we can see that in actuality the H alpha is slightly higher than the oxygen 3 but there's tons of cool little features that we have in here as well if I want to go really deep inside the analysis I can actually uh, use math to take uh, the um, derivative of my curve. So I'm going to remove the initial curve, which tells us where the transmission is. Um, so uh, just to be clear, uh, on the left we have the intensity, on the bottom we have the wavelength. And I'm going to take the derivative. And you can see that with the derivative we get this little like wavish pattern. And this is really cool because it tells us actually where the middle of the bandpass is. Simply where it crosses zero is where the maximum of the bandpass was, so where its middle is really. And I can just see that it's actually at 501.6 roughly. And what's also interesting is that if we are interested in knowing how wide or how narrow the bandpass is, uh, which is uh, measured by the full width half max uh, parameter, we can actually use the pikes at the at the two two ends there and ideally I'd want it, it to be roughly at the middle of this little flat area so maybe something like this so we can see that the filter on one side is roughly 498.6 nanometers on the other side it's roughly 506.6 so rather than 7 nanometers we might have around 7.5 or 8 nanometers of full width half max compared to the uh, specified 7 nanometers now, if we look at the uh, H-alpha piece, we can do the same thing, except the middle, the H-alpha, the, the shape of that curve, the, the top was a bit like curvy, which means that the middle, we probably want to look at it around here. And we can see it's uh, 658.5. And if we want to do the same analysis, I can go in the, in the peaks there. We have 661.17, and the other one is 654.69. And so in this case, we have around 6.5 nanometers uh, compared to the quoted seven nanometers, which is better than specification, right? So this is very interesting. You can really go in depth within the software itself. Now, what I did, however, is go a bit crazy and uh, measure all of my filters, <laughs> uh, all, of my, all of my astrophotography filters, and I put them all in the, uh, the same chart here. And you can see all of my filters here. I'm just going to uh, disable most of them. So we can start with the uh, simple stuff, which is going to be my uh, SV Boni UV IR cut filter, which is that green line there. And you can see this is a great filter um, overall because it has around like 92% transmission, sometimes around here 96% transmission. So you can see the um, y axis is the transmission, 1 is 100%, 0 is 0%. On the bottom, we have the wavelength. And I'm looking at around 400 to 720 nanometers here. And uh, the, the bandpass actually ends a bit to the left of here, so there's, a, there's an actual cutoff. But the spectrum emitted by this particular light is not quite enough for me to give you good results there. But we can see that the drop-off on the other side of things 
is around 700 uh, nanometers, which is exactly as per specifications of this uh, UVIR cut filter. So this is doing really well for now. And uh, wideband filters, they tend to be much easier to manufacture. And this one, for the moment, it has my seal of approval. And this is a really, really cheap UVIR cut filter and seems to be perfectly fine. So this is great. Now we can look at the Optolong L Pro. Uh, the Optolong L Pro, which we can see in red here, uh, it's the spectrum itself is pretty much as per, as per specification. So if you look at the actual uh, specification curve and you compare, compare it to this, you can see pretty much the same thing. And I did check like all of the dips where they're located, all of the peaks where they're located, and it is really exactly as, uh, as specified, which is really awesome and that works perfectly well. And so the Optolong L Pro also for the sample that I have, because this is always one sample out of many, and you'll see that uh, for narrowband filters in particular, we can really have a bit of variability between different filter samples. Um, but for now, uh, I am pleasantly surprised to see that my Optolong L Pro is definitely behaving as per uh, specifications. Now let's have a look at the Optolong CLS CCD. Uh, the Optolong CLS CCD, if we compare it to the L Pro, it's like a, a more restrictive version of it, except maybe at the right there. It's very interesting though. I would have expected the L Pro and the CLS CCD to kind of have the same cutoff at the right hand side. Uh, the specifications of those filters, at least the charts I've seen, are not quite precise enough to be able to say like, this is good, this is bad. Uh, and also my CLS CCD sample is actually very, very old, uh, back when uh, Optolong was just getting on the scene. Uh, so there might have been big changes since then. But the yellow part is the CLS CCD. It's basically uh, a cut down version of the L Pro to be more restrictive so that the middle band, band passes that we have in the L Pro here are no longer selected. Let's have a look at it alone. And you can see it's, uh, it's working perfectly fine there. And this is uh, really, really perfect. Uh, so up to now, we're doing good. Um, no big problems, I'd say just like the, the cutoff at the, at the end there is, yeah, 705, not a big deal. We're, we're doing okay. And now we're going to go towards our narrowband filters. I'll start with uh, dual band uh, filters, uh, where, for which I have uh, the IDAS NBZ, uh, the uh, Optolong L Extreme, and the Amplia ALPT filters, uh, aka the Golden Filter. And those are very interesting. Let's start with the IDAS NBZ that we can see here in blue. Uh, by the way, I want to specify that the, uh, the uh, bottom values there, I, when I did those measurements, I forgot to took the dark frame. And uh, if you actually sub subtract a dark frame, you get pretty much the 0.01 value that we see here, it goes down to zero. So off-band rejection is typically quite good. And I'll uh, mentioning it out when off-band re rejection uh, of the band passes that uh, of the uh, wavelengths that we don't want passed is bad. And here the, this IDAS filter looks overall really neat. So we can have a look at the top of uh, the, um, of the band pass here, and we can see it's 498.5 nanometers, which if you know the uh, wavelengths of oxygen three, which is what this little wave there is trying to get, you'd be like, hey, this is not correct. Uh, oxygen three is 500.7, but there's actually two uh, wavelengths for oxygen three. So there's 500.7, which we want to capture. There's also one around, I think 496, if I remember correctly. And what's very interesting is you can see 496 is very close to the top. And uh, 501 or 500.5 is also very close to the top. So this, this band pass there on the oxygen three side is very well built so that you have close to maximum transmission, which by the way is around 96%, which is very, very good. Um, and the, it's engineered so that it passes both. The one at 496 is typically one third um, of the signal of the one at 500.7, but is very much worth uh, including. Um, and the uh, full width have max if we uh, look at it. So we have uh, roughly uh, 504.5 on one side and around uh, 492 uh, on the other. So I would say, yeah, 12.5 nanometers 
maybe 12 nanometers. I mean, the quoted specification is 12 nanometer full width half max. We are measuring 12.5 nanometer. Yeah, okay, just like the optolong and extreme, I think we can have very small variabilities. And this could be due to the spectrometer itself. So I'm, I'm looking that as okay. So on the oxygen-3 side of things, everything is great for that filter. And if we go to the H-alpha, we can see we have a nice uh, transmission as well with uh, overall we have like something like 97% uh, transmission which is like at the very tip maybe even 98.5% transmission which is absolutely amazing and the uh, full width half max again 653 to uh, 665 12 nanometer basically so it is as per uh, specifications. And uh, what's very interesting is that H alpha, the frequency, the wavelength that we're looking at here is at 656.3, uh, I think. And uh, we can see that 656.5 is actually the very tip, the highest value of transmission of that spectrum. Again, like really, really good there. And I, I really like um, this filter and you can see it's well designed and well built. And you can see that the H alpha also happens to be on the left hand side of the uh, of the, uh, the the band pass, the actual wave. And this is actually really good because if you've watched my other videos, you'll you'll know that uh, filters, depending on the angle of the light that hits them, they suffer from blue shift or from band pass shift. Basically, what happens is that if you have a very fast lens or refractor the um, light rays that arrive through the center of the lens from infinity, so basically light from the stars, which is basically at, at, at infinity, they will hit the filter at 90 degrees. And this is what you can see here as the result. This is the bandpass we get. But for those light rays that reach the edge of your objective lens, uh, it, they will reach the angle uh, the filter at an angle and because of the way that those filters are built this will cause a shift of the band pass to the left so towards the blue and that shift is more pronounced in the red spectrum so h alpha sulfur 2 than it is in the blue spectrum like oxygen 3. so having this uh the, the peak of h alpha towards the left of the band pass it's actually really great because that means i can suffer a lot of band pass shift uh, before you know my my actual band pass starts to not capture H alpha anymore, um, and so this is really really good to see uh, in this particular case. And uh, this kind of thing, by the way, is particularly important if you use a system like a hyperstar telescope or a RASA telescope because you have very fast focal ratios, which means that from the edge of the objective lens, the angle is really quite extreme to the filter, but at the same time, the, you, ha you have a central obstruction. So you do not have any light rays that are 90 degrees to the filter. So you never get this ideal band pass, right? For any of the light rays that enter your system and hit the filter. So that's why this is really good to see. If I'd had to complain about one thing about this filter is that the off-band rejection sometimes is like this, this little, uh, little thing there with uh, three, four percent transmission, uh, which, you know, is not great. It, it will let in some light pollution, but not a big deal. And we can, uh, we can forget about it. So that is for the IDAS NBZ. And now let's have a look at the Optolong L Extreme. So you can see compared to the IDAS NBZ that is in blue and the Optolong L Extreme is in purple, the Optolong L Extreme appears to have much less uh, transmission. And this is actually a limitation, I, as I mentioned at the start of the video, I believe, a limitation of this little spectrometer because its sliding window to measure is, uh, is averaging via basically a Gaussian curve um, with a full width half max, max of 1.5 nanometer to get the value of each point, which means that when you have a very narrow band pass, even when, when it is at the top of that band pass, it will be averaging out the value with the, the highest transmission and then values next to it that have less transmission. So uh, we cannot compare really the, the transmission uh, values of the IDAS NBZ to the Optolongal Extreme. If I still had my Altair Astro 7 nanometer band pass dual band filter, I'd be able to compare apples to apples, but here I'm not able to, so I'm not going to try. Um, I do know that for the IDAS uh, NBZ, the 12 nanometer uh, band pass is enough to really work around that limitation of my spectrometer. At any rate, let's have a look at this. So if we look at the top of the uh, of the Oxygen 3 bandpass, you can see the top is actually around 
this doesn't look very good, right? The, the peak is at 501.5. It means that if you look at 500.5 or 501, roughly, so the, the real peak of oxygen three, where I have my mouse right now, um, it, it feels like we're missing something, right? We're, we're not at the maximum transmission, but we're still very close to the maximum transmission. And remember the blue shift the bandpass shift with high light and incidence angles. It means that for oxygen three at least, even with a lot of shift, my bandpass will start shifting to the left, which means that maybe at F4 or even F3, I'll start having better transmission uh, than at F7 or F10 because the bandpass for the high incidence light rays has shifted to the left. And so that means that my Optolong filter can work excellently uh, with, with a fast focal ratio telescopes, which I have actually seen in uh, some of my previous videos and I was very surprised at, by the way. Now, uh, the full width half max, if we look at it roughly, um, let's say 498.5 to let's say, yeah, five, I'll be a bit generous with that. 505.5, uh, that would be uh, seven nanometers, but as we saw earlier in the video, we already measured it. It was more like 7.5 nanometer is in oxygen three. Uh, if we look at this part here, we can now see that 656.5 or 0.3, which is what we want to capture. It's as we were saying towards the left hand side of the band pass, which is awesome uh, because again, and the, the, the H alpha uh, wavelengths is more uh, the, the HF band pass is actually more uh, sensitive to this band, band pass shift. It means that it will be passed even at high inc incidence angles. So even with uh, telescopes like RASA or my Hyperstar C6, we're going to get, get great results. And this is also what I observed when I was uh, testing out this filter. But my filter is a jewel among Optolong L extremes because as I detailed in another video, there can be a lot of variability between those Optolong L extremes. Some are only good at like F7, others are good down to F4, and then they start losing H alpha if you go faster than that. Uh, like um, we, I saw some YouTube videos where uh, we were getting no H alpha basically at all at F2 on the RASA telescope simply because the light incidence angles made H alpha, uh, made the bandpass shift too much for H alpha. But my filter is extremely resistant to that. I have an exceptional sample of the Optolongal Extreme, which is awesome. Okay. Uh, let's end. The, we already uh, looked at the uh, bandpass uh, FWHM, which was around 6.5 nanometers. Let's go to the next one, which is the Antlia ALPT, which has uh, band passes of 5 nanometers. Now, uh, just like before, the uh, band passes are tighter than the L extreme, so transmission values can't really be uh, compared. So I'm not going to try to quantify the uh, transmission. That said, we can say see that in uh, oxygen three it is. Uh, much lower than uh, in H alpha. Uh, so let's look a bit at the oxygen three piece. So we can see that if I go and I look at uh, where my oxygen three um, band pass that I'm searching for is, we can see 500.5 or 501. So it's in between those two points. We can see we don't have the maximum transmission for the main oxygen three uh, band pass or wavelengths, emission wavelengths. And, uh, and plus, the more we get band pass shift, the, the weaker this is going to be. This is not starting well. Now, if we look at 496, we can see it's also, it's there as well, it's quite low. So this might rescue this filter a little bit. And uh, this value will actually get stronger with band pass shift. So maybe it is intentional, I am not sure. But for such a very narrow band filter, I would actually have expected uh, this uh, 500.7 value to be better centered. Um, but maybe it was a strategy. Uh, I didn't see that many issues with oxygen three, even at fast speeds. So it's possibly indeed rescued by this 496 nanometer emission band of oxygen three. So I'd say uh, probably okay, but it, I'm not sure whether this is exactly what uh, Antlia was looking for in their filters. 
Now, if we go towards the uh, right hand side, uh, sorry, let's go first to the, the FWHM. We can see it's roughly 496.5 to uh, 502, which would give us roughly 5.5 .5 nanometer uh, for width half max, which is like close enough to specifications. If we look at um, H alpha, we can see another piece where uh, H alpha is like, um, it's around here, uh, 656.5, right? It's towards the right, right hand side. Plus we might have some uh, small error of measurement of up to 0 0.5 nanometers. Uh, but still, even then you can see it's more towards the right hand side of the uh, band pass, uh, which means that it will be more affected by blue shift, so by high incidence angle of the light than uh, than other filters like my AL Extreme. And actually I've tested this ALPT at F3 and at F2. Uh, and it was actually quite bad uh, at F2 and, and mediocre at F3 for H alpha. So this, com this measurement really confirms my feeling about this filter. I think it's a great filter, but I'm wondering whether there is variability between the different samples that were built and whether you know the the H alpha wavelengths might not be slightly better, it might not be better to have it slightly better centered. Uh, so that's for the um, Antlia. Now the H alpha, by the way, I'm, it might be like a problem of measurement with my spectrometer because if we look very briefly at the Astrodon H alpha, you can see it's roughly more or less in the same spot, except that if we look at the uh, the target band pass. Uh, for the Astron, it's like it, almost towards the maximum, but slightly towards the right. Uh, so maybe the, uh, the spe we're seeing a 0 0.5 nanometer or so difference from this uh, spectrometer, in which case H alpha might be better centered than uh, I, I would think. So that's a, a possibility. Either way, this is fine, right? It's not a big deal and we can live with it. Okay, so now we've looked at all of the three uh, dual band filters that I have. We are now going to look at uh, my favorites, the batter filters. So batter that I have, they're single band and they are all uh, optimized for fast focal ratios, meaning they've been pre-shifted. And it's gonna be very interesting to see that. Let's start with, um, let's say, Sulfur 2. So I actually have two sulfur two batter filters. One is a 36 millimeter uh, diameter and the other is two inch diameter and sh they should be the same specs. And in effectively, we can see they're roughly uh, the same. Like one is around uh, 674, the other is 673.5 or 73. So they're roughly 0 0.5 nanometer away from one another. This is perfectly acceptable. And the uh, target wavelength for uh, sulfur 2 uh, is uh, 671.6. So we can see that even if we look at the left hand side, the, the left spectrum, we're basically a couple of nanometers away, like two nanometers away. Let's remember that. So we are pre-shifted to the right by two nanometers, which is good. It means that it will work well on RASA systems, awesome. But let's remember that figure two nanometer because then I'm gonna look at the batter oxygen three. Unfortunately, I have a single filter for this because I sent back the uh, two inch filter uh, something like six months ago and I still haven't gotten a replacement. But you can see that the, the top is around 503.5 for that 36 uh, millimeter filter in oxygen three. Uh, which is three whole nanometers away from our, our target wavelengths. Even though in the blue spectrum, blue green spectrum, uh, blue shift is less significant. So I would expect actually sulfur two to be uh, pre-shifted more than oxygen three, but we can see the reverse. And uh, my previous filter, if I remember correctly, the two inch filter that I returned was, had a peak at 504.5, uh, which, was even worse and we were capturing very little oxygen 3 in my uh, Hyperstar C6 uh, telescope. Uh, so uh, this filter is probably not great either, but it's better than the two inch filter that I had. So there's that. But would I actually spend the amount of money that I spent on that filter knowing this? Nope, absolutely not. Uh, and, and this 
filter probably is not gonna work very well in a fast newt, right? Because it's pre-shifted too much in terms of the, uh, the Oxygen 3. So this is another disappointing Oxygen 3 filter, although I cannot say that I'm uh, surprised since uh, the, the previous one that I had, the two inch was even worse. Uh, so yeah, this is for uh, Sulfur 2 and uh, Oxygen 3. I'm not going to go through the, F, uh, uh, the, the full width half max uh, measurement. Uh, in, in for each of those filters, suffice it to say that they're actually pretty good. And uh, they're, they're typically around 4 nanometer, and they're basically up to spec, which is perfectly fine. Let's have a quick look at the batter H-alpha. And here it's very interesting, I'll hide Sulfur 2 and Oxygen 3. Okay, these two filters, one is a 2-inch H-alpha pre-shifted filter, the other is a 36 millimeter H-alpha pre-shifted filter. They're supposed to be identical. Um, do they look identical to you? <laughs> they're not. They're not identical. Uh, the peak of one is around uh, 658, the other is 659.5. Uh, so we have 1.5 nanometer difference between the two. It's much larger than what we saw with Sulfur 2, where they were much more consistent. So again, we can see that we don't have a very consistent um, filter manufacturing capability, at least when I bought those filters six, seven months ago now. Um, so I'm a bit disappointed by what I see here, and we can see that the, uh, the, the pre-shift compared to the target wavelengths is uh, roughly three nanometers for the one on the right, and it's roughly uh, 1.5 to two nanometers for the one on the left, which means that probably the one on the left will work well for fast newts, and the right, the one on the right will work well for Raza. So it's actually, and the one on the right is actually the two inch filter, which is what I would use for my Hyperstar slash Raza. The one on the left is 36 millimeter, which is what I would use for my fast newts. So it kind of works out, but, right? You don't know what you're buying in advance. And, and this is why having a spectrometer like that relatively cheap, because like a, a real one would be tens of thousands of dollars, uh, it's, it's a really good thing. And that's pretty much it for the, uh, the, the batter filters. So you can see that overall, I'm disappointed. Like Sulfur 2, they're consistent, but the band pass shift is two nanometers versus oxygen three, which is like three nanometers versus H alpha, which is 1.5 to three nanometers. Something is weird there. It, it doesn't quite make sense. I mean, those filters are cheap, uh, but you know, I would prefer the filters to be 50% more expensive if they were performing exactly as per specification. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would like to see less variability for those filters overall. I think there's too much lottery. And now let's look at the King Astrodon. Um, let's start with Astrodon Oxygen 3. So we're now at three nanometer full width half max. So the transmission figures have suffered uh, even more. Although uh, if I compare it to the Antlia ALPT, I, I, it looks 75% for the Astrodon, 76% for the Antlia, even though the Astrodon should be actually significantly lower because of its tighter band pass. So I'd say like the, the Astrodon is actually performing pretty well. And if we look at the top, the top is 500.5. We're looking at a wavelength of 500.7 that we want to capture very well centered with the, uh, the, the, the pr problem that's going to be less good on uh, fast focal ratios, especially for uh, telescopes that have a central aperture like RASA are uh, Newtonian telescopes, which is not a surprise and something that I have experienced. At f4, this filter is perfectly fine. Uh, when I start getting to down to f3, uh, like the, the amount of light with a central obstruction, mind you, the, light, the amount of light that I'm capturing is, is starting, you can feel the signal to noise ratio is not accumulating as fast as you would expect. Uh, but that's like, uh, that's exactly per the documentation released uh, by Astrodon back in the day. I, I bought those filters, by the way, before Astrodon by, was bought out by, I don't remember what firm. Uh, but it's like, maybe, uh, it, it, this is perfectly good. If we look at uh, Sulfur 2, uh, we can see, uh, like, this is actually when you see that the transmission is 0 0.87. 
this is really, really excellent. Uh, because remember the limitation of the spectrometer, the tighter the band pass, uh, the, the lower the uh, transmission will be. I, I expect the real transmission to be, uh, to be well into the 90%, even though the guaranteed transmission is just uh, above 90%. And we're probably at around 95, something like that. This is really neat. And we're looking at um, a band pass uh, that centers around 671, where we're looking at 671.6. Um, but again, as I mentioned for the other filters, we can see we're close to the uh, to the top. We're close to maximum transmission, and um, and we might have 0 0.5 nanometer uh, up to 0 0.5 nanometer uh, of slight imprecision from the spectrometer. But we can see that this uh, Astrum filter, it's performing great, uh, especially at slow or normal focal ratios. I used it a lot at f4. It was perfectly fine at f4, but when I did try it out at f3, again, signal to noise ratio didn't seem to accumulate as much as I would expect it to for such a fast focal ratio uh, system. And actually, um, I remember testing it against this uh, 36 millimeter uh, batter S2 filter and seeing that the, the batter filter actually in my fast mute at f3 performed better than the astronom filter but that only makes sense because we're looking at a system with a central obstruction so all of the the uh, light rays are angled relative to the filter and the astronom filter is very well centered and very very tight whereas the uh, batter one is pre-shifted so it's as perfectly as i expected um so that's perfectly fine and uh, let's have a look at in the end at the Astron H alpha and the H alpha is basically the same story and uh, the uh, band pass the top of the band pass we want uh, 656.3 we see 656 is really at the top uh, 656.5 is slightly down again we might have the 0.5 up this to this 0.5 nanometer in precision especially in the red spectrum for some instance I, I don't really see that in the blue spectrum um, uh, overall I'm not worried I think that this is uh, well centered and my experience with the Astral and H alpha this particular sample there has been great down to f4 although again at f3 when I compared it to this uh, 36 millimeter uh, batter pre-shifted H alpha alpha filter, the batter filter performed better at F3. It, it seemed to be gathering more signal to noise ratio faster than the Astrodon. But again, this is expected. The Astrodon is well, cent well centered, maybe actually a bit to the right of the band pass, which is not great because that makes it weaker against uh, band pass shift. But you know, I've, I've never been in effect uh, um, disappointed by those H alpha filter by those astronom filters when I was using them still it's very interesting to see that they might not be as great as uh, I would think think them to be but again you know uh, might be a bit of difference from the spectrometer um, like s2 H alpha the, the, the actual wavelengths might be to the right hand side of the band pass which is less good against uh, band pass shift for fast systems. It's still going to work well, and it's my, in my experience, it has worked, worked well, but not as well as against uh, the uh, batter pre-shifted H alpha and S2 filters. So the batter pre-shifted filters, they might be a bit inconsistent, but at least for the samples that I got for H alpha and sulfur two, not oxygen three, for H alpha and sulfur two, they did perform quite well overall. Although uh, I would expect that my two inch S2 filter when placed in that fast newt would actually not have performed as well as I expected because the instance angles that I get in my fast newt are not as acute as the ones in my Raza. So just to add the, uh, the full width half max of all of those Astron filters, I measured them basically at three nanometer as per specification. So overall, you know, great uh, series of filters. It's interesting though to see uh, that the uh, oxygen tree filter seems to have less transmission than uh, the H alpha uh, and uh, sulfur two filters, which was the same case as like the Anthea ALPT for instance. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure we're comparing apples to apples here. So quite interesting. 
and uh, I'm not actually completely sure, going back to the Oxygen 3 from Astrodon, whether if uh, I didn't have the limitation of my spectrometer, we, whether we would reach even 90% transmission, even though that's the guaranteed uh, transmission floor for the, uh, for the filter. I don't know. So Astrodon, awesome, uh, but there could be some uh, little limitations there, but I can't quite affirm that they're not exactly up to spec despite the price paid because of potential imprecisions with the spectrometer. So that's it for uh, looking at all of those filters. So again, I think this, uh, this, uh, this little tool there is, uh, is quite interesting. It is expensive. It has its limitations as we've seen here, but um, it really can help detect egregious problems with filters and I think it might make sense for some dealers for instance or for some well-off astrophotographers to to get something like the spectrometer to really check all of the filters that they have or uh, you know for dealers check the filters before they sell them it's still cheaper than those lab spectrometers that cost a lot more money even though again uh, it has its limitations. There is one more thing, by the way, about this spectrometer that I've been uh, wondering about. If I uh, go back to just like, let's say the Astrodon filters, you can see that the, the band passes don't look quite uh, symmetrical, um, on, especially in the red part of the spectrum and especially for very tight band passes. Uh, this is currently under investigation by uh, Goelab, the maker of, uh, of that spectrometer. Uh, so that's just an interesting little uh, little bit there. Uh, otherwise, that's pretty much what I wanted to show in this video. I hope it was instructive and that you learned something. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like there is lottery in the filters. Overall, I am I'm pleased by, by what I'm seeing. There's really no filter except maybe the Oxygen 3 from Batter that really I would definitely not buy. And the Antlia, it's a bit like dodgy, but then it still gets some of its band of the oxygen 3 band, band pass uh, or wavelengths at 496 so it's actually working pretty decently and we can see the antlia is actually um if we look at the uh we compare it to the uh, astrodon it's actually centered exactly almost exactly the same as the astrodon in the h alpha which is always um, a good sign and with that that's it for me uh for now um if you have any questions, any remarks about what I've done, or you, you think there are issues with my procedure, uh, please let me know down in the comments. If I made mistakes, I typically put it in a pinned comment at the top. So uh, if you want to double check the content of the video, do check the comments as well. If you like the video, please leave a like. If you didn't like it, leave a dislike, even though YouTube apparently doesn't care about dislikes anymore. And uh, yeah, uh, subscribe, all of that good stuff, even though I do not know when is the next time that I'll do a video. We entered the rainy season in Japan and um, yeah, I haven't actually touched my telescope in a long while. I've actually downsized uh, and sold a lot of my equipment to simplify my procedures. And I want to just concentrate on my Hyperstar setup with a color camera and a multi-band filter because my L-Extreme is so awesome for that, just like my IDAS is so awesome for that. So that's pretty much it. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.